come and present to others. Pastor Cleveland Prince. Amen. Father, we're here and we're grateful to be with this body of believers to worship you and to worship with them in this great celebration of 48 years in this location and in this city. We thank you for them. We pray that you would continue to bless them, keep them. Lord, help us to continue to think about you and not all those things that are arrayed against us, but to keep our eyes on you and our eyes on the prize knowing that we are victorious in you. Bless the word as it goes forward. Hide me behind your cross that your word may be living and breathing in the lives and minds of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I should have been crucified. I should have been hung on the cross. I should have died there in disgrace. But Jesus Christ, God's son, took my place. Not only did he take my place, he took your place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He took the place of all who would accept him. You know, the, the Bible, uh, the word is all inclusive. Everybody can be a part of God's family, but the sad thing is everybody will not be a part of his family. God is all inclusive, but he's also all exclusive. He's inclusive in that you have the right to come to him, you can accept him, but you're excluded if you don't accept and come by way of his provision, the foreordained plan of Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ, his son, of Jesus Christ, his son. When I was listening to the church history, the only thing that could come to my mind was a phrase from that song, Amazing Grace. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. It was grace that brought me here thus far, and it will be grace that will bring me home. That should be your testimony when you listen to what Saint Greater St. John has been through, through name changes, through fires, through storms, through lots of people, through not a lot of people, but God has kept you here through many dangers. You ought to get happy before I get happy. Why am I, why am I more happy than you? Through many dangers toils and snares you have already come it was God's grace God's grace that brought you here thus far even through all the things you've gone through we've gone through uh, COVID we've gone through deaths we've gone through fires we've gone through high places we've gone through low places but one thing that is sure is that God's grace is sufficient his strength is made perfect in our weakness and when I am weak he is strong so you can depend on him no matter what is going on in your life. So that, that testimony, that great church history, 48 years, 48 years that you've been here, God has kept you. The tendency is that we only get happy when there's a lot of people. I, I, I'm, I, sometimes I get happy in my car by myself because I just know how good God's been to me. I don't know if you think God's been good to you. If God's been good to you, you give him a hand praise. Don't worry about whether, what the numbers are, who's here, who's not here, whether or not uh, they're going to come. Don't worry about that. God has been good to you personally. As a preacher, sometimes we want to preach to a large crowd, and we, we look out in the audience, but I'm just saying God said be instant in season and out of season. He just said preach. He didn't say preach to a whole lot of people. I'm reminded that Jesus preached to one woman at the well. And because he preached to her, a whole city was saved. So we need to quit trying to look at numbers and trying to see who's here and say, wow, I don't know if I can get my praise on because there ain't nobody here. Well, when you hear, that's a majority. You and God is a majority. So I'm thankful to God. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful to God to be here. They sang that song, I'm so glad to be here. I hope you're not just singing the song. I hope you really mean it that you're so glad to be here. I'm so glad to be here. I can sit down now and preach. <laughs> but we're thankful to God for you. Uh, 
Uh, we, I didn't open them, but the usual giving honor to God, but I already give him honor. But I do want to mention that I do have count your pastor as a great friend of mine. He has always welcomed me here. You notice I always come when you have an occasion. And I don't come simply to preach. I come to celebrate. Uh, I don't have to be on the program to come and celebrate and support Greater St. John because I appreciate the leadership you have here. I appreciate the deacons you have here. I appreciate all of you and the welcome that you always have. You know, people will not remember what you say, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And if you want people to come in, they got to feel love when they walk in the door. They got to feel love when they walk in the door. So we're thankful to God that we're here to celebrate with you. Celebration, you know, sometimes on celebrations we have big parties. But sometimes we just have intimate gatherings. And those parties, and today is an intimate gathering, celebrating 48 years of your place in this community. There are so many churches, I'm, I'm being a little long, there are so many churches that doors have closed. There are so many churches doors have closed. I've told our True Light family that God kept you here for a purpose. God kept these doors open for a purpose. God has purpose for Greater St. John in the community that you're located here in San Jose. If you don't believe that, then you need to walk out because why are you here? God has purpose for Greater St. John. God has kept you through all those things because he has purpose. The question is, are you ready to fulfill your purpose? Maybe that should be my sermon tonight. Are you ready to walk in your purpose? But that's for another day when you, if you invite me back. Uh, I want to stay with your theme. I want you to turn with me to Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 1 to 6. You know, God, when I uh, was placed at True Light, uh, God placed on my heart to teach out of the book of Ephesians. Because if the church is going to change the world, the church must be unified. So he placed on my heart that the very first thing I needed to do was teach on the unity of the church. And so this theme that you have resonates with me because that's what I've been teaching on uh, for the past couple of months. I only, uh, I've been teaching on it. I only got to verse 15 of the first chapter. So we've been working with that right now. But it reads like this, Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. I'm reading from the New King James. I, therefore the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and the Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. You may be seated. I want to focus on just one clause of your theme, of one clause of this text that you selected as your theme, as your foundational text for this celebration, this 48-year celebration endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And I want to talk to you about the unity of the believer in a divided world. The unity of the believer in a divided world. We're living in a divided time. Division is all around us. And walls are built that seem to separate us. These walls seem insurmountable. We're divided by race, by gender, by social status, by sexual orientation, by education, by denominational affiliation, by fraternity, by sorority, by gang affiliation, and by political affiliation. Look at, look at. The government is divided. The Congress and the Senate, the Supreme Court, all divided. Division and disunity is more common than unity. Division and disunity is more common than, and disunity is more common than unity. We live in a country that is called the United States of America, when, in, when it is in reality the divided states of America. 
divisions all around us and can show its ugly face among believers. We have to be careful because we can be uh, infected with the disease of division. We can be infected with the disease of division. Division comes from the devil. Division is not from God. And we can be infected by the things that are in the world. We can be distracted by the things in the world, and it can distract us even now while we're sitting here in this building. Right now, your minds can be on something that happened in the news. Your mind can be on that somebody stepped on your shoes. Twice, by the way. <laughs> you can be distracted by any number of things that is happening around you. You can be distracted by the person that's sitting next to you on the bench because they didn't say hello to you. All those things are the beginning of what will cause division. So if Greater St. John is to be the church that God has called it to be, it must fight against division. So we, are, we need to be aware of division. Division is a result of strife. It's a result of pride. It's a result of arrogance. It's a result of aggressiveness and impatience. It is a result of intolerance and hate and is the opposite of love. You need to put a pin in that. It is the opposite. How can we say we are the living body of Christ and we don't love? Because God is love. He's not just about love and he didn't just give love. He is love. And because he is love, if he's in your life, you must be able to love. You must have the same characteristic, the same mindset he has. God is love. You know, God is so much love that while you were yet sinners, he died for you. So we need to have the same thing, the same mindset, the same inspiration, the same focus that God has and that he is love. I'm on my way to heaven. Let me share this with you. Love is sacrificial. Love is inconvenient. Love does not happen when everything goes in your way. Love comes when you, the love is needed when you are not ready to give it sometimes. Love is inconvenient. The death, Christ dying on the cross was inconvenient. It wasn't convenient. How can we say we are the church and we're unified in the body of Christ is when our brother and sister need us and we can't show up? So division is the opposite of love. It's the opposite of humility. Pride will cause division. It's the opposite of gentleness. It causes you to have a harsh reaction to somebody. It's the opposite of gentleness. It's the opposite of patience. You're impatient with people. You can't stand that they did something to you. They looked at you sideways. They might not even been looking at you. Something else was happening in their mind, but they looked at you sideways, and you've taken it personal. It's the opposite of loving forbearance that should be an evidence in the church. What should be an evidence in the church is patience, gentleness, meekness, tolerance, and against us there is no law. Because that's the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience. You read that in the book of Galatians. That should be the characteristic of greater St. John as a local branch, a local branch on the vine of Christ, and it should be the characteristic of the universal church. I'm, 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 I'm saddened sometimes. I'm saddened sometimes because we're so parochial in our thinking. That's an educated word. We're so parochial, that means we're so localized. We only care about where we are. And that then we think like we're an island and we don't, we don't understand that we're part of a bigger body. Yeah. You are maybe the baby finger on the hand of one arm. Okay, okay, okay. The finger does not stand alone. The baby finger, the little toe on your foot does not stand alone. No, no. You're part of a bigger body. You're part of the universal church yeah. that Christ died for. So we're parochial in our thinking, and that's why we don't fellowship like we should. That's why we don't support like we should. We have churches that are without pastors, and have we checked in on them? Have we checked on them? Have we said, do you need anything? Uh, we, don't, we just say, well, let's pray for them. I'm, I'm like James. James says, don't just pray for somebody. You don't say, be filled, and I don't have the capacity, and I don't meet their need. Yes, sir. Yes, 
I don't meet their need. That's not love. I'm just going to pray for you. We're going to pray for you. We look so, we look so pious when we do that. Yeah, yeah. I'll pray for you. <laughs> and, go, and you know what? And you ain't whispered a prayer. You better say that now. Tell the truth. Ain't whispered a prayer. We're so parochial in our mindset that we, are on, we make ourselves islands. And that's part of division, that we don't think of ourselves as bigger than where we are. Greater St. John is part of a bigger body of believers. True Light, St. John Baptist Church, um, ever, uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church, some of the bigger churches think that they are where God is. But God is in his body, and every church, every birth blood-born believer is part of the body of Christ. It's his church that is distinct and separate from every other organization. The church is an organism, not an organization. The church is motivated by the body of, by the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit indwells every believer. The Holy Spirit indwells the church and he breathes and gives us life. So the church is living. It's not an organism. Uh, not an organization. It's an organism. A fraternity is an organization. The Salvation Army is an organization. Right. The United Way is an organization. Right. Your sorority or fraternity is an organization. Right. But the church must be separate and distinct from organizations. The church is, uh -huh. not must be, but is yeah. a living organism. It yeah. is a body of Christ yeah. in the world. Amen. You are the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Yeah. You are his body and you're attached to a head. A, a body with no head is dead. But you're attached to the head, and the head is Jesus Christ himself. He gives us our marching orders, and he said that we must be unified in our faith. You look at the text. The text that you prayerfully selected for this 48th church anniversary is appropriate and powerful and necessary. You may not know why you selected this text. I'm sure you prayerfully did it. But God is trying to send a message not only to Greater St. John, but to every other church. We need to preach this message more than just on this 48th anniversary. We need to work to continue to maintain and build unity among God's people. Everybody who's standing on the word of God, everybody who believes that Jesus Christ is the son of God, everybody who believes that he is the way, the truth, and the life, everyone who knows that it was his blood that purchased you, you are, you are part of his body. You, you are part of the baptized community, baptized in the spirit. Not only in water baptism, but baptized in the spirit. You read that in this text. So the text that you prayerfully selected, is appropriate, powerful, and necessary. Uh -huh. And we need to be reminded of our identity. We forget who we are. We forget to who we belong to. Right. And that's why we get so parochial and so separated and so divided because we, we forget who we are and who we're connected to. We forget who blood has washed us. We forget who breath is in our bodies yeah. that caused us. We forget why we got saved. Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes, I think sometimes we forget how bad we work. Sometimes I say this, uh, 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 when I say this, and, and I think we have this kind of disease also in our minds, some of the worst counselors for drug addicts are ex-drug addicts. You know why? Because they don't have no tolerance. They, they done broke the cycle, and they're not using drugs anymore, and so now they're looking down on those. Why can't you be like me? We don't need to have that attitude. We need to say, you are just like me, and the only difference is that I am part of the body of Christ. And I want to invite you to the body of Christ. Amen. We don't need to be looking down on people because all of a sudden God has changed us. We ought to be happy that God changes and share that with somebody else because they need to be changed. You know, the church exists. The church exists to, for the salvation of the world. You are the light of the world. Because you know what? The people sat in darkness, but they saw a great light. You are the salt of the earth yeah. because you are the one that preserves and seasons and cause flavor to happen in the world. Right. You are the one that God has placed here yeah. in this community. And if you don't exhibit unity, yeah, 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 you yeah. failed in your purpose. Yeah, 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 yeah. Paul opens up this chapter with an exhortation to unity. Yeah. His whole, this whole book of Ephesians is talk. He starts off in chapter one and he thanks them and he praises them for how they showed how much they love Christ. But he gets to this fourth chapter and he opens up this verse, this text, uh, at, uh, talking about unity. But he first compliments them, if you notice. He first exhorts them. He says, I want you to walk worthy of your call. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
I want you to walk worthy. That's the question. Are we walking worthy or are we just walking? Uh, how are we walking? He says, walk worthy. What do you mean, Paul, walk worthy of your calling? Live like you're supposed to live. Pray like you're supposed to pray. Believe like you're supposed to believe. Be the example that God has called you to be so you can ex exemplify who he is so somebody can uh, notice. Yeah. You can't be darkness and call people out of darkness. You must be light. Yeah. Light is not effective unless it's in darkness. Salt is not effective unless it's placed on something. God has placed you where you can be flavor, preservation, and light to a dark world. So he says, walk worthy of your calling. But then he didn't say this, and remember I mentioned about the drug addicts, he, the, the ex-drug addicts. He said, not only walk worthy of your calling because you were called. Uh, let, me, let me say this on my way to heaven, as Pastor Campbell would say. God made the first move. In your life, God's a primary mover. We say, I found God. No, God found you. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we act like we, I went looking for God and, and I found him. No, he called you and you answered. God is the primary mover in your salvation. God was the one that planned the plan of salvation before the world began. Even in the Garden of Eden, after man sinned, God came walking in the cool of the day and said, Adam, where are you? God came walking in your cooler today and said, where are you? And you answered. Yeah. And you accepted the sacrifice he made. So he said, walk worthy of your calling. Yeah. It's not because of you that you're saved. It's because of him. Yeah. 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 Amen. Then he said, not only walk worthy of your calling, but walk with humility and gentleness. Yeah. That's the part we miss. Okay. Okay. We walk with pride and arrogance. Look at what God did for me. We walk with tailor-made suits and nice shoes from Shoe Palace. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, 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 we want to look good. We drive in nice cars. Uh -huh. And, and, and uh, Reverend Allen keeps messing with me about my cars. But God lets you like, likes you to have nice things, but it shouldn't make you proud. Yeah. I will even let him ride with me once, one time. <laughs> After that, I don't know. But we, we look at what we have instead of what God has done. He said with humility and gentleness, whatever God has given us, he's given us to further the kingdom, to use it for service. That's all it's good for. They're all temporary things, but he says, walk worthy of your calling, but do it with all humility and gentleness. That's what he said. With long suffering, with patience. We don't have enough patience for one another. We don't have enough patience. If we are to be the church, uh -huh. these are the characteristics that we must have. And then he says, not only do that, but bearing one another in love. That means I'm not holding grudges. That means if somebody does something against me, maybe they were mean to me. I don't retaliate. I pray for them. So Paul opens up this exhortation in, in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, talking about the characteristics we're supposed to have. He says, bearing one another in love, the same way that Christ bears us in love. Uh -huh. But what I want to focus on in this text right. comes out of your selected text, a text and is in verse 3. Endeavoring mm. to keep the unity of the spirit in the bonds of peace. That means that you can lose the unity of the spirit. That means that you can cause and hinder the unity. That means each and every person has a responsibility to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit. Selfless love, he said, keep the unity of the spirit in the bonds of peace. Selfless love makes for peaceful unity of the body that is characterized by oneness. In the organization, that means in the hierarchy of the organism, in hope, in belief and identification, all reflecting <clears throat> the oneness of the Godhead. Don't you know that if you exhibit division, you're not representing God? God is expressed in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He is, is called the tri-unity. God is unified in purpose. While Jesus Christ takes a subordinate role, it's called voluntary subordination. That means he took on, he humbled himself before the plan of salvation. The Holy Spirit voluntarily subordinates himself. Jesus sends him <coughs> into the world. It's not that they're not equal. 
they working together for one purpose, and that's your salvation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we need, to, uh, uh, we need to also practice voluntary subordination. That's another big word. Voluntary subordination. Making ourselves lower than what we think we are. Jesus had every right to say, I don't need to die for them, I'm God. The Holy Spirit says, I don't, have to, I don't need to speak for Jesus and God. I'm God. Why am I taking a lower level activity? Yeah, yeah. Not because I'm lower, I'm God. I was there from the beginning. God worked in unity to create the world. God works in unity to save humanity. And we are to exhibit the same kind of unity that he has. So he says, endeavor to keep. There are four points of emphasis. The word endeavor means to do something with intense effort and motivation. That means it takes effort, intense effort, major effort. You can't just have to do it one time. You have to work at it, endeavor. It means to work hard, to do one's best, to work with a set purpose. Your purpose should be unity. Your purpose should be unity. It should be unity of the spirit in the bonds of peace. It's do your, do, do your best to preserve the unity which the spirit gives. Do your best, that's individual, to preserve the unity that the spirit gives. If you do your best and you do your best and you do your best, collectively we're all doing our best and we can have unity. We're all working for the same purpose. We're exercising the same thing that God exercised that we take whatever role he gives us and we work for the good of the body. <coughs> Everybody can't be the pastor. Everybody can't be the usher. Everybody can't be the lead singer. Everybody can't be the cook. Matter of fact, too many cooks spoil the food. Everybody can't be the quarterback or the point guard. Everybody can't be that, but whatever you can be, God uses you for the same purpose as he used all the rest of them for the good of the body. No matter what your position is, they may give you all kinds of titles. Really, I'm here to tell you that title of pastor and all that is not a title, it's a function. God calls you to a work. We, we give people titles. God calls you to work. When, you call, when he calls you into heaven, he ain't going to say, well done, pastor. He's going to say, well done, now good and faithful servant. He's not going to call you by whatever title, bishop, archbishop, Sam, Sam, Santa Claus, whatever title you have. He's not going to call you by that. He's going to say, servant, well done. Some people now call themselves servants. Oh, that's the title of giver. I'm a servant. My call me servant so and so. That's not a title, that's a function. And we are called to fulfill the function that God called us to fulfill. He didn't call you to be everything, He called you to be what He called you to be. So you must endeavor to maintain unity. You must preserve unity. You must do your best to preserve unity. The same unity that the Spirit gives, the same unity that God has exhibited in the Godhead. Then he says, not only endeavor, but he says, endeavor to keep. You already have unity, but keep unity. Are you with me? Deacon Glenn looking at me like he lost something. (laughs) He said, endeavor to keep. Hold on to. You know, everything worth having is worth holding on to. And sometimes you have to fight to keep what you have. Why do you have to fight to keep it? Because somebody want to take it away from you. Somebody want to steal your peace. You got to fight to maintain your peace. Somebody want to steal your possessions. You got to fight to maintain your spiritual possessions. If they take your, your, your temporary possession, you can get some more of that. But you need to hold on to what God has given you. He's given you spiritual life. He made you part of a family. He made you part of a, a body. He gave you an inheritance that should not be taken away. The devil works through other people and through other issues to try to steal what you have. So he says, endeavor to keep. Hold on to what you have. Don't lose what you have. If other people fall off, you hold on. Don't worry about the numbers. Don't worry about how many people are here. Don't worry about what's happening. Don't worry about who shows up to celebrate with you. You hold on to what God gave you. 
So he says to keep, to maintain, to have, or retain possession of. To cause to continue in a specified way. A specified condition. Yeah. Unity is what you possess. But you don't just possess unity. The United States, the disunited States said that we're united. Yeah. I'm here to tell you that we don't have much unity in this country. We know this from uh, the African American perspective. We were not meant to be part of this nation. We were not considered. And I'm, I'm sad to say that white folks that are poor don't recognize that they were not meant to be part of it. It was for the rich landowners, the rich white landowners. It wasn't for just everybody. It was for select people. We're going to be united, but everybody's not part of that. Well, in God's kingdom, there's no division based on race, color, creed. There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, all are one in Christ. There's all a one in Christ. So you come into a united position in Christ. So we have to reign, we have to endeavor, work, put forth the effort to keep. And what, we are, what are we keeping? The unity of the spirit. The spirit of what binds us all together. The spirit of the Godhead is unified in purpose and attributes and love and peace. There's no contentiousness in the Godhead. God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are not fighting. They're not saying, well, you know, you, you were supposed to do this, but you didn't do it. They're not saying, well, I'm not going to talk to you today. They stay unified because their mind is on one thing. That's the recovery of human beings. From the very beginning. From the very beginning, he said, we're going to have a plan. And everyone that is in the Godhead, the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit says, we're going to have a plan. They knew before the foundation of the world, after they even created man, that humanity would fall. Yeah. And they said, we're going to provide something to get them back because he is our prized possession. Yeah. Humanity is God's prized possession. Yeah. Humanity has infected the world. Everything you yeah. see comes from the germ of sin. We infected the world, and God has a plan not only to save humanity, but to recover the world. Yeah. Yeah. And it's through you. Yeah. So you must endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit. The unity of the Spirit is God is unified in purpose. There's no contentiousness in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each fulfill their role in the plan of salvation and human recovery. Right. We are to fulfill our specific role in the body of Christ for the redeeming of humanity. That's the purpose why we're here. We're not here just to sing and jump and shout, perform, yell, raise money. That's not our only purpose. Everything we do should be for the furtherance of God's kingdom because his spirit is resident in you and moving in you and causing you to care about what's going on around you. You on your job are light on your job. You're there because somebody needs to know Christ. Where you go to school, you're there because somebody needs to know Christ. In your neighborhood, you're there because somebody needs to know Christ. You have purpose, and we must fight to keep the unity of the spirit because the church is the only place where salvation can occur. Salvation occurs because you are the reflectors of God's mercy. You are the reflectors of God's grace. You are the reflectors of God's love. You are the light of the world. So we must endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit, okay, by following the example that we have in Christ. John 17, 20 to 23 says, I do not pray for these alone but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one. We pass over that, that high priestly prayer in John 17. Read that chapter sometimes with an open mind, seeing what God is saying to you, that they all may be one. He didn't stop there, period. He says, as you and I are one. Yeah, yeah, right. That as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that here's, here's the reason why that the world may believe that you sent me. Right. Unity of the believer sends a message, message that Jesus Christ is alive and present in the world. You. That's your purpose. Bless you. Amen. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they, uh -huh. you are God's glory, that they may be one yeah. just as we are one, I and them, you and me. Jesus said, I am them, I am them and God in him. Amen. You are little goddies. Knew I made up word. Back in the day, they had hippies. 
They had hippies. Okay, they were part of a group. You are little goddies. I didn't say you were God. You're part of God's family. You are who he has identified as the loved ones, the beloved ones. He calls you the beloved in the scriptures. You are the ones that he said they're my inheritance. And I, he's the one that gives you the guarantee of the spirit. And he seals you. So you are his reflectors in the world. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I and them, you and me, that they may be made perfect. Be, that word perfect means complete okay. in one. Yeah. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Your unity, your endeavoring to keep the unity, let the world know that God loves them. And it lets you know that God loves you. And then he said not only that. As I rush to a close, I know you're ready to get out of here. He says, endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That's the absence of contention. Have we lived to that standard? Can we honestly say that we've done that? I can tell you sometimes I haven't done that. And if we're honest, we can say sometimes we haven't done that. But he reminds us that we need to move out of that way. I wear this cross not because it's jewelry and not because I, I think it's sacrosanct. Another big word. Um, not because I think it has some illusory power. I wear it because it reminds me that God took something unholy and made it holy. He took an old rugged cross that was an emblem of sorrow and shame and he made it a honored place. So I wear it because it reminds me that God took an unholy man and made him holy. God took a, a decrepit, a, a diseased person and made them whole. Yeah. That's why I wear it. Not for any other reason. Not because I want somebody to think I'm super holy. But it reminds me when I, when I want to get angry on the freeway. All right. uh, this cross is around my neck. It caused me to think about it. Yeah. It caused me to think about it. So I wear it because it reminds me. I used to be against wearing it, but I started wearing it because I want to be reminded that God can take something that's not holy, right. someone that's not holy, someone that is not worthy, someone that nobody might have saw any good in, and he turned it around. The cross was what God made holy. And so you need to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Peace is a bond. Peace is a bond. Unity is not created by the believer. But the, but the believer is called to maintain and preserve unity. Unity is not, thank you, unity is not created by the believer. We don't create unity. We get our unity from who we are attached to. We get our unity from God. We have the unity of the spirit. The spirit gives unity. The unity that the spirit gives, we need to maintain and endeavor to keep. But the believer is called, you are called to maintain and preserve unity. He says, in the bonds of peace. Who's peace? Who gives peace? Jesus gives peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives peace do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. We recite that 14th chapter at funerals, but it's, it's for us that are living. The 14th chapter is not for the dead, it's for the living. The dead already is gone there, but it reminds us that he gives us peace in the midst of our troubled storm. He gives us peace in the turbulence of the world. He gives us peace, and our peace we share with one another because he is our peace, he is your peace, then we can all maintain unity in the bonds of peace. It is important for the church to keep unity in the church. It's important. This is not something you should take lightly because it's 48 years and somebody came up with a theme. It is important. I may not be able to shout you, but I'm going to share with you what God says. He says that we are one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 20. There are many members, yet one body. Many members. Look at your body. He uses that example by reason. Even your hair has function. I mean, we, we like hair so much we buy it. Men walking around with toupees, you know why? 
You need hair. Glenn got to wear a hat. Because he let his hair get bad with that Jerry Curl he had back in the day. He burned all his hair off. But even our hair, every part of our body, I was telling him the other day that I had appendix. Uh, I, we don't even know what an appendix is or what the purpose of appendix is. But I tell you, when you get appendicitis, you know. You get appendicitis, you know. <clears throat> and every part of the body serves a function. Every part of the body is, in, is important to the body. Every member is important to the body no matter what your function is. Every function is important to the body. So he says that we have many members but one body. We got one arm, but there's many things in this arm. We have one hand, but there's five fingers on the hand. And in that hand, they got all kinds of nerves and blood vessels and all kinds of things. Everything works for the good of your body. And when the body is not working right, when the body is not functioning in unity, it is diseased. And that's when operations happen. That's when you want to cut things off because the body is diseased. We don't need to be the diseased body of Christ. We need to be the healthy body of Christ. And the only way to do that is to endeavor work to keep unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Yeah, yeah. We are called to unity of the spirit. Unity in the church because we are members of one body. We're called to keep unity in the church because we have the same spirit. We're called to keep unity in the church because we're called into one hope. We're called unto one Lord. We are united by one faith. And we're baptized by one baptism. We're baptized into one anotherness. Just as, one, just as the body is one and has many members. And all members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. You cannot be a healthy body of believers if you don't maintain unity. So as you go forward, you want to know that you're healthy. We have one God. Yes, sir. He's the father of us all. Yeah, amen. And he is above all and through all, and we have his DNA. Yeah. When you become the body of Christ, you have God's DNA. You carry his genetic makeup. Yeah. You carry what he carries. If he is love, you are love. Yeah. If he is patience, you are patient. Yeah. If he is kind, you are kind. Yeah. You exhibit the fruit of the spirit. You experience love. You exhibit love, joy, peace, long suffering, meekness, gentleness against such there is no law. Because of who he is and because of you are in his body, you carry his genetic makeup. We don't understand who we are. We don't understand what we have. We don't understand our exalted position in Christ. We have one God. He's the father of us all and we have his DNA. One time, not long ago, 2,000 years ago, Christ established his church. He walked the dusty earth many years. He walked and carried. He, didn't, he was homeless. He was ostracized. He was kicked out. His family turned it back on him. He understood what you're going through because he came for a mission. He came for a purpose and he walked. Now you're called to walk for that same purpose. Whether you're ostracized, whether you're made fun of, whether you're kicked out, you're called to walk the same way. So he walked. And then he prayed. You're called to pray. And then he was patient. His disciples would, uh, would argue, would argue Lord, you, why, why are you saying this? Lord, why are you saying that? And Lord, can I have a position on your right and your left hand? Lord, I, I, don't, I want to be better than everybody else. And then one said, I want to sell you for 30 pieces of silver. He walked for a purpose. The situation and the circumstances were not optimal. They were not the best. But he walked this dusty earth. And not only did he do that, he walked to from judgment hall to judgment hall. They brought him somewhere and they accused him of wrongdoing. Yeah, yeah. They said that he was intolerant. They said he was a blasphemer. They said he said all the wrong things. Yeah. And they judged him based on those things. Yeah. And he walked and he walked and he walked. Yeah, sir. Yeah, sir. He walked in his purpose. Exactly. Not only did he walk in his purpose, he died on purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't just die. Yes, sir. He, didn't just, he wasn't a martyr. He was dying for a purpose. He came, on, he came to die. Yeah. He came to be your sacrificial lamb. He came to be the lamb of God to take away your sins. He came to be the bridge to recover humanity. He came for your re reconciliation. He came for your hope. He came for your redemption. He came for you, so he died on purpose. Yeah. 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 
we go to that and we, we run over that, but he died on purpose and he went through that on purpose because it cost all that to redeem you. He, it cost him every bit of that to redeem you. So he goes to an old rugged cross. He carries an old rugged cross up the hill of Golgotha on purpose. He let them nail him to that cross on purpose. He let him put a crown of thorns on his head on purpose. He had purpose in everything that he did. And not only that, they pierced him in the side. He let him do that on purpose. They, they gambled for his clothes on purpose. He allowed all that. He could have called 10,000 angels. But he had a purpose. He came on purpose. And then he died on purpose. They couldn't kill him. He gave his life. They couldn't take his life. He gave his life. You can't take life from the life giver. He had to lay down his life. They thought they killed him, but they couldn't do it. And he gave his life. But he didn't stay there. I'm so glad that the, the womb is empty. He didn't stay in Mary's womb. I'm so glad that the cross is empty. He didn't stay on the cross. I'm so glad that the grave is empty. He didn't stay in the grave. He rose on the, on the third day for your salvation. Christ established his church. Christ prayed for his church. Christ died for his church. Christ rose for his church. He sent the Holy Spirit to live in his church. He empowers his church. He unites his church so that his church can be a change agent in the world, so that his church can be a light in the world, so that he will be present in the world through his church. Work to keep unity. Strive to keep unity. Fight to keep unity. Pray for unity. And most of all, live in unity. Amen. The doors of the church are open. Amen. The doors Amen. of the church are open. Amen. I need you. You need me. We're all a part of God's body. Stand with me. Agree with me. We're all a part of God's body. It is his will that every need be supplied. You are important to me. I need you to survive. You are important to me. I need you to survive. You also come I need you. All you have to do is confess you with your mouth me. and believe in your heart. We're that the Savior came, the Savior died, and he's coming back for you. Stand with me. The church are open. Agree with me. We're all a part of God's body. It is his will that every need be supplied. You are important to me. I need you to survive. You are important to me. Need you to survive. Oh, you pr I pray for you. You pray for me. I love you. I need you to survive. I won't harm you with words from my mouth. I love you. I need you to survive. I pray for you. You pray for me. I love you. I need you to survive. I won't harm you with words from my mouth. I love you, I need you to survive, you are important to me, I need you to survive, oh, you are important to me, I need you to survive. Amen, amen, we have done as the Lord has commanded us. None have come, still there is room. Amen. 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 Now Amen. we're going to Amen. turn to the hands of our pastor. Amen. Reverend Johnson. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, Johnson. Amen. Amen. Let's do God another pen. Praise for our preacher. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. The believer in a divided world. Amen. That was a good message because we're in a divided world. And we have to be careful, amen, that we don't find our one foot in and one foot out. Amen. One foot on the world and one foot with God. Amen. The Bible says you be hot or cold. Amen. But a believer, amen, 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 having unity in a divided world. But thank God for the message and the messenger. Amen. This time, amen, somebody from the committee. Amen. Have remarks. Remarks. I know Sister Hobbs is here. Sister Johnson is here. Amen. You don't have to really have a sign. Hey, Ms. Sister Hobbs a hand as she comes with remarks. That's I mean, right. I'm a That's right. Anyway, but I'm going to go a little bit further. So Amen. I just thank yes, everybody sir. here tonight that came out tonight. I was really blessed. I'm glad I'm here, and I thank God for everybody. Amen. I'm sorry. If you're not busy tomorrow night, please come out and um, celebrate with us. Okay, it's our 48th church anniversary. Tomorrow night we're uh, having our guest churches will be Holy Assembly, Mount Nemo. And the auxiliaries in charge will be the Minister of Wives, Minister of Alliance, Men Department, Women Department, Youth and Young Adults, and the Music Ministry. So if you're not busy tomorrow night, please come out and help us celebrate. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> amen. 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 Thanks, Sister Hobbs. And uh, Sister, Sister Owls, I see on the committee as well. I didn't say her name, Sister Owls on the committee. Sister Johnson. Amen. And I think Sister McGee. Uh, Sister McGee. Amen, Sister McGee. Amen, Sister Norman. Amen, amen, amen. We want to continue to keep Pastor Riley in, this, in our prayers. Amen. Pray for Pastor Riley and his whole family as they travel to Texas for this passing of, uh, of his father. Amen. No, I think his mother passed away not too long ago. Amen. Now his father. Keep him in our, in our prayers and, and, ask, and, and uh, greater friendship right down the street. And my Sister Hill, amen. She blesses a lot of people in the congregation and other people a lot. Uh, every month and food distribution and she passed away uh, the other day so keep uh, the greatest and fresh and family in our prayers as well amen like Reverend Prince says amen. Not, not just in our prayers but what we can do do it amen amen not just pray but what we can do do it amen 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 we want to bless uh, the preacher amen you can and you should bless the preacher who who preaches the God's word amen so on behalf of our church family and the, on the whole committee we want to amen Preacher. Amen. 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 This time we're going to give the uh, last remarks and benediction. Amen. From our speaker. Amen. Pastor. Amen. The pastor, Reverend Cleveland Prince. Amen. Amen. From the True Light Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. I want to thank. Let's be good. <coughs> I want to thank Reverend Johnson for his remarks and. Pastor Nolan, thank you for the, in <clears throat> the invite. <clears throat> I got to quit yelling so much. Want to uh, thank you for the invite. Want to thank you. I, I, I tease uh, Deacon Glenn because he lived down the street from me when we was growing up, and I remember him as a as a young. He's a, about a couple years younger than me. I look younger than him, but he's a couple years younger than me. <clears throat> but I remember him so, and I'm I'm always pleased when I come here to see what God has done, where He's taken him from, and where He's bringing him to. And all of us should have that testimony. But we're thankful to God for you. And uh, once again, it's not the numbers. It's what God has done. So don't worry about the numbers. God's going to do what he's going to do. And he's going to do it through you. So we want to thank you for your kindness. And I always feel welcome when I'm here. Uh, 
Uh, I'm so happy for my young uh, Reverend Cleon right here. Um, he's doing well. I was glad to be here for his ordination. I'm proud, of, I'm proud of him. So keep everybody in prayer. And remember, bear one another's burden and so fulfill the law of Christ. Let's all stand. <clears throat> Father, we're grateful for this time together, for this body of believers, this branch on the vine, the true vine of which you are. We pray for their continued success, their continued longevity, their continued spirit of working together. We pray that you will unify them more and more, that they can look more and more like you. Not only for them, but for all of us that are in the body of Christ, that we grow together in you, that we may be one just as you are one. Now may the love of God, the grace shown through Jesus Christ our Lord, and the permanent precious presence of the Holy Spirit go with us as we leave this place. And we all said together, Amen. Bless you.